All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Monica McCubrey. I am the Wildlife Education Specialist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission uh, here in Lincoln. And uh, way back in 2020, we I started Science Of as a way just to interact with some of our constituents during COVID. As you know, we couldn't go anywhere. That seems so long ago, um, and yet it was not that long ago. So um, this has kind of just been a really popular program. And a lot of people, I guess, really want to know about a little bit of in-depth things about uh, science and some things, natural phenomena that happen in Nebraska. So we've kept it going. Um, I pick and choose topics based on what people have mentioned. And this has been a really popular topic. A lot of people would like to know about these um, mountain lions. So that's why we're kind of doing this today. So I do also want to introduce my co-host, um, Amber Schiltz. Um, there were a lot of people on today, so I wanted to make sure that we can monitor the chat and also get some people's questions answers as they come up. So hi, Amber. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Amber will be monitoring the chat, and then there's a few breaks during the program today that we can stop and look at the um, chat to see if there's questions. And then we always do kind of a short question and answer session at the end as well. So just so everyone knows how we're going to go about doing this today. So I'll go ahead and share my screen with everybody, and we will get started. So. All right. A lot of people coming in. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so we'll go ahead and start. Uh, we're going to be talking about mountain lions today, which is always a popular topic uh, just because they're a large cat. Um, they're a predator. So it, it's a really interesting topic. And a lot of people have been asking about this for a while. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we got to cover this. Uh, like all of our programs, we want to make sure that uh, we're relating to the topic on hand. So please ask questions, have some comments. Please feel free to put them in the chat. Like I mentioned, um, Amber will be monitoring monitoring the chat as well today. Um, but if we're, just like I said, make sure that we're staying on topic and that we are relating to the content on hand and that we're being kind and friendly to everybody and we will not have a problem. So I also wanted to point out um, there's been some um, information about what this webinar will contain. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone understands that today we're talking about evolutionary history. We're talking about the biology of mountain lions. We're talking about their very unique and fascinating adaptations that they have, and then also their role as a predator. So um, we will not go ahead and hit any topics today, such as the hunting of mountain lions or permits, um, the depredation or regulations. Um, we do have our uh, fur bear and carnivore program manager, Sam Wilson. Um, so if you have any questions regarding those topics, um, I know he always loves to discuss, loves, loves, hates mountain lions and loves to discuss them. So um, there's a um, email address down there. It's just sam.wilson at nebraska.gov. So if you have any questions um, about those things, please direct those to him. Uh, we will also put his name and his email in our resources and links uh, when we send that next Monday as well. All right. Um, I also want to point out that I love science. Um, I am by no means an expert in any of these subjects. Um, I am an expert in science communication, so education and the role of an educator. Um, as an educator, our goal is to give those scientific facts and then have people um, take those and run with them. But our goal is to give um, those scientific based facts to people. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, get started. Like I mentioned, there's a lot to cover today. Um, I kind of was like, oh my gosh, I hope I have enough to talk about for 40 minutes or so. And then I was like, okay, I have too much, so I had to dial it back. So there's a lot of cool information, um, but I always like to start at the beginning. Um, so what is a mountain lion? Where do they come from? Um, what's their evolutionary history? So I always like that, and I think it's fascinating. Um, so originally they were from Asia. So these animals, a long time ago with lots of other types of animals alongside many other animals. They crossed to America about eight and a half million years ago. Um, they did not look like this. There's lots of lineage when we talk about this here in a second, um, but they're, they're mountain lions and they're related to uh, the African cheetah, the jaguarundi. There's a lot of different types of um, lineages that we'll talk about. And I'll show you a picture about how they relate to other animals as well, other felids or cats as we like to call them. Um, one study I found back in the 40s in 1940, they showed about 30 subspecies and another species or another uh, paper in about 2000 showed that there are 32 subspecies of mountain lions. Um, so there's always been a little bit of uh, complicated history when it comes to their origins and how many subspecies they have. Um, 
So we're going to kind of go through that today. So um, when we talk about mountain lion, it was first described from a specimen that was collected in Brazil in 1648. And then if you've been in biology or you kind of remembered a ninth grade biology, um, Linnaeus, the person that kind of classified and taxed things into categories, he put them in something called the Felis Concolor in 1771. And then another person in 19, 1834, um, basically he said, I think I'm going to put them over here in something called the genus Puma, um, which it still remains today. So um, mountain lions, from what I found, there's a lot of different subjects about how many subspecies there are. Um, if you've ever heard of the Florida panther, um, which is a small kind of isolated population in Florida, um, it is, I think, an endangered species. I'm not sure if it's endangered or threatened, but it is a species at risk. And it's definitely one that is a subspecies of the one that we have even in Nebraska. So um, there's a lot of different um, subjects about how many we have and how many there still are. So um, I was going off of the research that I found. But overall, they have been represented in the fossil record for about 300,000 years. Um, and based off of their mitochondrial DNA analysis and all these other um, ways of moving things and understanding how they fit in those taxonomic hierarchy, um, we're basically finding that um, these animals, we think um, the elimination of the Pleistocene kind of wiped out a lot of other animals, a lot of those large mammals, um, and it made way for other animals. So these have been around for a long time, um, and their lineage is very interesting, at least to me. Me. So um, here's where they kind of fit. So a single ancestor in that Felidae, um, and here's where all those other animals fit. So you can see things like the caracal or the serval, the lions, the lynxes, and the bobcats. Um, these animals, they fit in that puma lineage. Like I mentioned, the um, African cheetah, we believe that there's an ancestor there and they're very closely related to them as well. So it's kind of interesting to see how they fall on certain animals. All right, so that was like a short evolutionary history. There's a lot more that I could have gone into, but I understand that time is valuable and there's a lot of other things. So let's go ahead and figure out what do these animals look like? So identification wise, um, when you look at the Guinness Book of World Records, these animals are in there as the animal that has the most names of any other animal. So people, you might have heard them called cougars or pumas, panthers. Um, there's also some people that call them screaming lions or ghost cats. Um, so they have about 40 names and they hold the record for the animal with the most names. So even if you look in the Guinness Book of World Records, they're there to the animal with the most number of names. So um, there's a lot of different names that people call them. Overall, they are the same thing. So a cougar, a lion, a mountain lion, a puma, they're all the same animal. There's just lots of different names. Um, they're also the large cat species that is native to the Americas. And they're also the most wide ranging cat species in the world as well. They can be found as far north as Canada and all the way down as far as south as Chile. So um, pretty wide range when we look at these animals. So what do they look like? Um, well, they're a cat. Um, so they have typical cat-like features. So if you imagine um, a domestic house cat like you would find in your house or a feral cat, um, they have that typical cat physique. They have the ears, they have the short nose, they have a very long, slick body. Um, they have a long tail. Their tail is about nearly as long as their body. Um, if you think about where you would find a mountain lion, they have quite a range of habitats, everything from rugged terrain to areas that may be a little bit more um, tree-like and have bluffs in them. Um, so they have a long tail for balance. So very similar to like your house cat, um, they use their tail for balance. Mountain lions just have a little bit longer of a tail. They have rounded ears. Their eyes are set pretty wide on their head. Um, there's a little saying that goes along that eyes in the front hunt, eyes on the side hide. Um, so it's kind of a good way to remember is this a prey animal versus a predator animal? So um, these are pretty um, recognizable animals when you see them. Um, so same with all felids, except for the cheetahs, mountain lions have retractable claws um, in their toes or in their digits. So when you see a track um, and you're like, is this a dog? Is this a, is this a cat? Um, cats, unless you're finding a cheetah, um, they're going to have no claws showing. So cats versus dogs. Dogs have the claws. Cats have the um, just the pads that you're going to see. Um, the nose that you're also going to notice, um, it's pretty short. Um, we'll talk about why that is here in a second. Um, and then their orbits or their eyes are very large. So these animals have impeccable eyesight. They have good sense of smell. They have great hearing, um, everything to make them an awesome predator. And we'll get more into that in a little bit. 
but I did want to show you what their skull looks like. Um, so hopefully um, everyone can see this here. I'm going to stop sharing really quick. Um, so this is what their skull looks like. Um, this would be the about normal average size of a mountain lion. Um, so if you notice, very large teeth, they have the short rostrum or the nose, and then their eyes, like I mentioned, they're set pretty wide in their head as well. We'll also talk about something here in a little bit. Um, this is right here called a Sagittarius crest or a Sagittarial crest. Um, this is where those muscles, those chewing muscles kind of connect. Um, and we'll talk about these in a little bit, but um, that's what makes them such good predators as well. So. All right, I got a lot of props, so we will um, go through those as well today. All right. All right, so when we talk about their scientific name, that puma cum color, basically it translates to cat of one color. So they have this pretty light cinnamon color, um, a white underbelly. They have black on the tip of their ears and on the tip of their tail. Um, like I mentioned, their tail is also very long, um, about the size of their body. And it is also about the same diameter when you go through the whole tail. So it doesn't get more fluffy at the end or smaller. Um, it's pretty much the same diameter when you look throughout it. Um, Male mountain lions, they can be anywhere up to eight feet in length and weigh about 100 to 100, 140 to 150 pounds. Um, females can grow up to about seven feet. They're going to be slightly smaller. Um, when you look at a male versus the female, they're very similar um, except for the size. The only true way, of course, to tell if you're looking at a female versus a male um, just by looking at it in the field would be to look at their genitals. Um, but again, knowing how large they could be, um, unless they're right next to each other, is very difficult to tell, um, is that a male, is that a female? So otherwise they're pretty much the same. They don't have different colors. Um, they're pretty much the same except for that size. All right, so kittens are a lot different though. So um, newborn kittens are gonna be heavily spotted. This is one um, that, it's so cute. I mean, how could you not love a little mountain lion kitten here? They have those bright blue eyes. They have the spotted um, uh, color on them. Um, so for the first three months of their life or so, they're going to be spotted. And then normally the spots begin to fade. However, that's not always the case. Um, reports have shown that up to a year, some spots are visible or up to six months that those spots can be visible. It just totally depends on the on the individual animal. So, um, so at two or three months, those kittens um, usually have been weaned and they're begin traveling with the mother. Um, around three months old or so, they're going to start to weigh about 50 15 to 20 pounds. And then about six months, they're going to weigh about 35 to 45 pounds. Um, but they do stay with the mother until they become independent. And oftentimes that's between 10 to 18 months. Um, again, it just depends on the individual cat um, or the family that they are, the terrain, the amount of food that they're getting, the environmental factors, all those things. So um, just because you also see a female out in the wild, um, it doesn't mean that she doesn't not have kittens if they are with her. Oftentimes um, they will be hiding or sometimes you can't see them. But just because you see an independent um, female does not mean that, that she does not have kittens. All right, so track identification. This is always kind of tricky sometimes when we talk about um, people sending in tracks. Um, is this a mountain lion? Is this a dog? Is this a bobcat? Um, so always looking at scale. So um, one of the things that I learned recently, um, and it's kind of like a duh thing, is when you show people with a hand print of like your hand next to the track, it's not always a good judge of scale because everyone's hands are very different. Um, I, for instance, have very long fingers and very large hands, so I'm not sure if I would be the best person to um, help with that identification. So if you have something that's always the same size, like a quarter um, or a coin or something, that's always a good helpful um, comparison to those tracks as well. Um, but when you look at tracks, um, the, what we're really going to notice is that their claws are not showing. So this is sometimes not always the case. It's hard to tell um, how the track, how old is the track? Is the track in mud or is it in snow? Um, has it been weathered? Was the animal running. There's a lot of different things that kind of play into this and the factors. Um, but normally when you're looking at a male track, um, they're going to be about five inches wide on average. And then females are going to be a little bit smaller, about four inches wide. Um, and another way you could look and determine that gender, if you're pretty good at this, um, you could look at something called the heel pad, um, which is underneath here. Um, so you see the four toes and then you see this little big blob right there, that splotch. Um, so that's the heel pad. Um, so looking at that, how large is it? Um, for me, if I just saw this in the wild, I 
probably couldn't tell you if it was a female or male. I would need some um, identification of them right next to each other. I would need someone to say, here's a male, it's a lot larger, here's a female, it's a lot smaller. So, but again, if you get good at this and you see these quite frequently, you kind of know what to look for. So, um, also, it could be a subadult, it could be a juvenile. Um, so sometimes people will get confused if they're looking at a young male versus a female. Again, it just depends on the terrain. It depends on the environmental factors that have kind of weathered that track. Um, but when you get used to it, I'm sure that you can um, tell pretty easily. All right, so here's just a quick image about looking at um, front and hind tracks versus domestic dog, coyote, cougar, um, what are we looking at? So um, as you notice the tracks, the um, claws are quite visible for the domestic dog versus the cougar. And then also the coyote is also pretty noticeable as well. So um, domestic dogs are normally a little bit larger, like my dogs are way bigger than a coyote um, would be, um, but I also understand they're smaller as well. Um, Coyotes also usually have sharper claws. Domestic dogs get theirs worn down by walking on um, your tile floors, your um, concrete, wherever you're walking them. So they tend to wear a little bit more. Um, normally you will not ever see a cat with a um, with claws. Um, cougars and bobcats look very similar. It would just be that size is a little bit different. Bobcats are gonna be a little smaller and cougars or mountain lions are gonna be a little bit larger. All right, so here's a picture of an actual image in the snow. Um, so again, if you know what you're looking for and you know how to measure, um, this is great reference to see, but you also have to understand how long has this track been there? Um, has it snowed frequently? Has it um, been really warm and then melted and has the track expanded? So there's a lot of things to take into consideration when we're looking at this uh, track. All right, also their stride length. So looking at this, um, how far is it between the paws? So um, when walking in the snow or on level ground, usually the mature male stride length will have an average greater than 40 inches. Um, we talked earlier, males are gonna be a little bit larger, females are a little bit smaller. Um, but like I mentioned, those various factors can lead to incorrectly reading tracks. So anything from the depth of the snow, um, the pace that the animal was traveling, um, the nature of the surface? Is it hard? Is it soft? And then also, like I mentioned, the tracks could have been left by a sub-adult. Um, so some that could help or that could um, kind of hinder leading to a different conclusion than what it actually is. All right, so those were just a little bit of key identifiers into our uh, mountain lines and how to look at them. I noticed that there were a few things in the chat. People are excited to learn about mountain lines and someone said they are cute. Awesome. So we will just go ahead and keep moving. All right, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about their distribution. Um, when I talk about this distribution here, I do want it to be known that I'm gonna talk about just the overall North America or the US. Um, I have a whole section about Nebraska mountain lions. So we'll go ahead and talk about those in a little bit in case you were curious. All right, so um, when we talk about their distribution, um, although they kind of occupy and occur at lower densities, they are the most abundant large felid that comes in North America. So um, historically, mountain lion distribution was most of the Western Hemisphere um, with human settlement and people moving westward. That's changed a lot. Um, so currently, mountain lions occur in a uh, suitable habitat. So remember, they are mountain lions, not river lions or prairie lions. They like that kind of mountainous terrain, but we have seen that they've occupied a diverse range of habitats um, because they've had to be flexible. So most of the western U.S., western Canada, and there's that small population of Florida panthers in southern Florida as well. All right, so that was mostly just the U.S., like I mentioned. So this is our big chunk of our um, program here. We're going to talk about their behavior. So what do they eat? The communication that they do, their reproduction, which is super interesting, by the way. We're going to talk about mountain lion tinder. If any of you know what tinder is, we're going to be talking about that because that's how mountain lions um, find a mate. Not really, but we'll get to how it relates to it. So. All right, so what do they eat? Um, so mountain lions, like um, other felids or cats, um, even your domestic house cat is technically classified as what we call an obligate carnivore. So they strictly eat meat. So they have a very interesting reproductive um, 
uh, and uh, digestive system, sorry, not reproductive, digestive system, um, where they can only handle certain types of foods. Um, some of your cats might like catnip. Um, funny enough, mountain lions actually have the same um, uh, reaction to catnip. They like it, um, but basically they will eat anything. They'll eat mice, raccoons, coyotes. Um, they could take down an elk in certain areas where they have them, feral hogs. Um, porcupines is also one as well. Um, when I first heard that mountain lions eat porcupines, I was like, how do they do that? Um, there's a spot underneath a porcupine where they don't have quills, and they, over time they've learned that that is like their weakness or their weak spot. Um, when they kill something, they may drag the meal to another area. They could cover it with dry leaves and grass and pine needles. Um, not always is this the case. Um, from the literature that I've read, um, basically about 75% of their diet is deer. Um, they typically hunt alone. Um, they could be crepuscular. They could also be considered nocturnal. Um, they have good eyesight where they can do both. And then on average, they kill about one deer a week. So they have really keen senses um, that they use for their um, an adaption to their uh, area. And so they're very good predators, which We'll talk about here in a little bit, but um, over time, if they do cache or kind of store their food, they could come back and visit that site over several days. All right, so their eyesight. So when we look at their eyes, we talked earlier about eyes on the side hide, eyes in the front hunt. Um, so these guys are definitely hunters. They're definitely the, that binocular vision, which is similar to what people have. Our eyes are in the front. They're not on the side like a deer. Um, so their eyeball, their pupil, and their lens are overall proportionally a lot larger than other carnivores. Um, so this basically helps them let in a ton of light. Um, so they're good crepuscular, active at dawn and dusk, or they're um, good nocturnal which are nighttime hunters. So um, eyes of cats are actually slightly smaller than people, but they have different types of adaptions. Um, for instance, humans have vi better visual acuity. Um, so we can see better detail um, at certain distances. Um, if you've ever gone to like the eye doctor and you cover one eye and you read the chart that says all the letters, um, that's showing kind of your, your depth perception and also the acuity that you can see in certain um, lights and also in certain depths. Um, so cougars or mountain lions will see better detail at night than humans can. So there's definitely a trade-off. They also have this very cool ability and if you've ever been driving at night and you've seen a deer or a skunk or a raccoon, um, they have an eye shine. So there's a special um, thing in their eye, um, that tapetum lucidum. So basically what happens, it what makes their eye shine. And uh, I think it translates to like carpet, um, something carpet, but it is talking about their shine of their eyes. If you've ever caught someone on a camera, like a human that has an eye shine, this is very different. That's just a glare. We don't have this um, very cool thing that mountain lions do, but a lot of other animals do. And it's just basically a way for it to double reflect um, and it helps them see at night. Um, so their eyes are very close together. Their face is forward. And they have really good depth perception and ability to judge that distance, which very much helps an animal that stalks their prey um, and will um, pounce on their prey as well. So um, they have extraordinary vision. Um, they're very used to hunting in daylight, or they also could hunt during the nighttime as well. When you look at their eyes, they can expand about 287 degrees, um, and they have about 130 degrees of overlap in their eyes. Um, but their most sensitive um, depth is about 50 to 80 feet. And that's critical for an animal, like I mentioned, that stalks their prey. So what do their eyes look like? Here's their total visual um, peripheral vision, and then also just their field of view. So it's pretty good for a carnivore and for a predator. It helps with judging dip distance and also that depth perception as well. But again, that binocular vision, that's what you see just right away. And then that peripheral vision is at 78 and a half that they're talking about here. So overall, 287 degrees um, visual field for this mountain lion. All right, so the movement sensitivity, um, if you've ever been hiking and you've seen a deer, you might notice that they freeze all of a sudden. Um, they 
have a very heightened sensitivity of movement. Um, biologists believe that is why um, it helps them track the movement of them prey of their prey and gives them that trigger to attack. It kind of explains why when you see like a deer or something, it will freeze right away um, after detecting a predator um, because that animal, um, that carnivore, that predator is watching for their movements. All right, so hearing, um, there's not been a lot of studies done. Little research has been done on the actual hearing of a mountain lion or their ability to hear, but we do know that they can hear frequencies in the ultrasonic range. Um, so basically this helps them kind of um, move their small head and move their ears independently from each other um, to get them a better isolate that sound. Um, you can see in this photo here, one ear is kind of straight and the other one's kind of turned back, very similar to your cat that you would have at home. And they also have have an enlarged auditory area of their skull. Um, so this basically surrounds that middle ear and it kind of helps a cat's sensitivity to certain sounds. And like I mentioned, if it's low light, um, they can't maybe see the best, but they do have good eyesight. Um, this really helps them as an important sense when they're hunting at night is just listening and hearing. All right, smell. Um, so these animals, um, they have a special olfactory organ um, at the very top of their mouth. Um, this is employed during what's called the flamen response. Um, so basically this is just a bunch of pheromones or chemical smells in the air um, that kind of gives information and communication um, to different mountain lions out there, basically trying to understand the reproductive condition of a female. So sometimes if you've ever noticed your cats, they kind of have their mouth open and their lips are up. Um, that's what we call the flame in response. Um, canines overall, so dogs, uh, wolves, they have a better sense of smell and a more developed sense of smell. Um, when we look at the percentage of their brain that's solely used for smelling, um, the dogs or canines, they have about 5% of their total brain is just dedicated to smell. And they have about 50 inches of olfactory cells, so smelling cells. When we uh, kind of compare that to a cat or a felid. Felids have about six square inches um, and then 3% of their brain is devoted to smell. So it's not bad. Um, it's just not maybe as well developed as something like in a dog. Uh, so I have a picture here. This was not in Nebraska. This is just one that I found on the internet because I needed the picture of that flame in response. Um, but this is what they're doing. It kind of looks like they're panting, but they're taking information and smells from the environment and trying to understand um, a condition of a female. Is she in reproductive state? Is she not? Um, what information can they grab from the air? So again, this was not from Nebraska, um, but this was a photo that I just found because I wanted to show that flame in response and what I was meaning by that. That. Monica, I have a quick, quick question. Yeah. Um, so someone asked about don't lions occasionally drag their prey into trees? I think they're referring to the food caching they do um, to store yes. their food. Yes. Um, I have a little information in that, I think in the next like three or four slides or so. Oh, great. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's a good question. Thank you. All right, um, so also when we talk about mountain lions and their senses, we wanna talk about their touch. Um, so they have a very acute sense of touch, mostly in their paws, their toes, and also their nose. Um, if you've ever have a cat or you've ever seen any type of animal that has whiskers, those are really specially adapted tactile sensors, especially used for in the dark. Um, they also talk about the paws of a mountain lion being very sensitive when it attacks a deer. I found this in one study that showed um, in pitch black, a uh, mountain lion can determine the location of the head of a deer just by sensing which direction the hair is growing. So if it's growing obviously down towards the back, the head is on the other side and vice versa, but they, it's so sensitive that they can, can feel that. So it's kind of interesting um, when we talk about that. Um, so I, I just thought that was something cool just to share. All right, so capturing their prey. Um, so these animals, they have a pretty light um, body. They have a very strong skeleton and they're very heavy, heavily muscular, um, heavily muscular body. Um, so basically they're, most of their weight when we look at their body is muscle and then that sinew tissue, which is just um, basically what unites the tissue to the muscle and the bone. Um, they have very long muscular legs. They have a very flexible backbone. Um, they have these long extended strides when they walk. Um, when you look at a mountain lion, their rear legs are gonna be larger 
than their front legs. This is to help when they're moving in kind of that difficult terrain sometimes. Um, but when we look at a mountain lion, they are built for speed, not necessarily endurance, but there have been reports of them capturing um, uh, pronghorn, which are the fastest land mammal in the North America, not in the, not in the world, but in North America, pronghorn antelope, sometimes we'll call them. Um, they're quite fast, but there have been times when a mountain lion has caught them before. Um, when we look at how they can move, they have horizontal leaps of about 45 feet have been recorded and about 15 feet vertical jumping. So think about a school bus. School bus is about 30 feet long. So mountain lions have been reported horizontal jumps of 45 feet, and then a basketball pole um, when you're shooting hoops or something is about 10 feet. So add another five feet onto that as far as a vertical jump. So um, pretty impressive for a mountain lion or really any animal. I cannot jump that far by any means. All right, so a little bit more about their skull. It's really short, it's very round. Um, and kind of an interesting thing is when you look at that versus a bobcat versus a domesticated cat, they have a very similar shape. Um, a bobcat and a domesticated cat cat have literally the same skull. It's just the size difference. Mountain lions have a little bit different shape than a bobcat, but not very much. Um, the skull is short and round. They have 16 teeth in the upper jaw, 14 teeth in the lower jaw. They have a very powerful bite. Um, because they have this reduced length of their jaws, it's not elongated, but it's like a short round one. They have these closing muscles, the temporalis and the masseter muscle. Um, and earlier I mentioned that sagittarial crest, um, that little smart bump that ridge on the top of their skull this is where that um, temporalis muscle attaches um, so they have a better surface area when they're biting into something um, they do not chew their food um, but they use their carnassial teeth to basically cut up their prey into smaller pieces and then they swallow it whole and then they also have a tongue very similar to the house cat it's very rough um, basically, these have little short um, horny protuberances that uh, when they lick something off the bone, it helps them get the meat off of the bone. And it also helps them with grooming as well, um, just like a normal house cat would do. So this is a picture of their skull. Um, again, you can see the, um, the orbits or their eyes. You can kind of see the sagittarial crest up here. It's really hard to see in this angle. Oops. Um, but then also the short rostrum, the teeth that overlap each other, um, those very, very large incisors as well. All right, sounds. A lot of people talk about the sounds that they hear from mountain lions. Um, they're very vocal during mating. A lot of people think they just walk around screaming, um, and they definitely don't because they're a predator and they don't want to give away their, their area or where they are to their prey or to other possible mountain lions that could be um, territorial. Um, they use a lot of whistles. Um, they can also do um, different types of uh, uh, whistles and they can also do growls and hisses as well. Um, whistles are kind of the use of communication between like a juvenile, a mom, and the females and the kittens. Um, so that they have a special um, communication just to communicate between those two. So um, kind of interesting is that as well. All right, and then reproduction. So talking about how they reproduce, I mentioned earlier that mountain lions use Tinder. I was not really wrong. They don't have phones where they swipe left or right, but they do swipe. So when I talk about this, they make something called a scrape. Um, so they pile up, a male will pile up a bunch of um, twigs and small branches, and basically it provides this elevated spot for them to urinate on. And the scrape is a way for toms or male cats to communicate with females. So their potential mates, they want to also warn off other toms that might be in their territory and try to steal their females, um, but they're very territorial and they have direct interactions often results in violence and perhaps death to some of those weaker males that would challenge a, a larger male. So these scrapes really allow communication and that declaration of territory um, without the risk of direct interaction. So um, that kind of helps them as well to find a mate. It's basically like a way to communicate. So if a female comes up, she smells the scrape, she's like, yeah, I, I could do this. Um, they will find each other. They sometimes will scream to each other during that mating time to find each other. Their territory can be very large, so they need to be able to find each other. And then from what I've read is that they go on dates. 
Like the male will get food for the female. They hang out for a while. Um, they'll do it and then they'll kind of leave each other. So the male will have no other um, interaction with raising the cubs or the kittens or anything like that. Um, the female will kind of do all that work. Um, but there are some times when um, Toms are known to kill other kittens, um, specifically ones that they did not father, because that triggers the female then to go back into breeding so that he can breed with her and he can hopefully carry on his genes as well. So um, that's kind of the reproduction of a mountain lion. All right, so then um, we're moving quick here because I still have a lot of information, good information I want to share with you. Um, so when a cougar or a mountain lion will find an animal, um, it kind of stalks it, it lowers itself to the ground, it continues to maneuver very quietly closer to that animal. Um, they can hold this position for quite some time. And then usually when they get about 50 feet or less, they will pounce or strike on the animal. So they strike larger predators with such force sometimes, like a deer, they can actually knock it off its feet. Um, the only thing is when attacking a mountain lion wants to make sure that it's important for them to keep their weight on their back hind legs, so it has a better way to maintain that control over that prey. And then their prey is normally killed with a bite to the back of the neck or the base of the skull. Um, and then they start to, to eat this animal. So um, one of the things I wanna talk about, I'm sure some of you have seen this before. Again, this was not in Nebraska, but it is kind of a cool, it's a trail cam photo. Um, there's a mountain lion stalking this elk and this elk clearly has no idea what's going on. So I'll give you like a second. And if you've seen this photo, I'm sure you know where it is. Um, but right, like when I first saw this, I spent like 10 minutes looking for this mountain lion and could not find it. Um, but there's a mountain lion very clearly in here. And once you see it, you're gonna be like, oh, okay, I see it. Um, but it just goes to show their amazing camouflage ability and their ability to be quiet and stalk their prey. Um, so giving you a, maybe 30 seconds here to look at that photo. It's a little bit blurry, but the mountain lion is right in there. So its face, you can see, is right here. There's a little bit of white on its chin. Um, it's been sitting here for a while staring at this elk. So it, again, just shows to show you how amazing they are at being a predator. And again, this one's not in Nebraska. It's all over the internet. You can find it pretty easily. But I just wanted to show you how good they are at being a predator. All right, so after the kill, um, normally what they will do is they will pluck the fur from the point of their incision using their teeth and their claws. Um, they will open up the flank behind the ribs. Um, they usually, um, the stomach and the intestines are pulled out, they're dragged away. Um, most often times, um, mountain lions will drag their food away so that they can eat under cover. Um, this helps with spoilage of the food. It also gives them a chance to kind of um, maintain that control so that no one else comes to grab their food or grab them. Um, so their heart, the lungs, and the liver are removed and eaten first. This is the area with higher concentration of protein and fat and vitamins. So if anything, they can't eat quite a bit or they don't have a lot of time, they want to make sure that they eat this part first so that they can get all that nutrients um, and then maybe cache their food later if they needed to. So um, different types of carnivores will have different preferences for where and how they feed on carcasses. So we we don't have black bears in Nebraska, but a lot of studies I found where they did have both of those predators in the same state, um, they talked about ways to identify the kill and the cache. So talking about them, there's very distinct differences between like a mountain lion, um, what they do in their preferences versus like a black bear. Um, so basically, um, it reduces the danger to themselves, and then also what's called kleptoparatism. Um, so different animals will take their food, basically. They don't want to do the work. They take their food, and they eat it, and they scavenge. Um, but basically, what's going on is that there's um, three ways for them to kind of, after they kill something, what do they do? So they hide. Um, so overall placement of the carcass. So if it's small enough, they will usually move it. If they can't move it, if it's too big, they will usually just feed and then leave. So um, um, they like to feed, like I mentioned, under some sort of cover, but it depends on the terrain. Um, a lot of the studies I read said that they will drag their food downhill. Um, there have been reports of mountain lions dragging food up into trees. Um, again, it just depends on the size of the animal and the size of the kill. Um, and then also caching. So um, cash kills, they will basically pile it up into a big bundle and then they'll put... Um, debris on top of it. They don't always do this, but some of them do. They, like I mentioned, they usually fold it up into a bundle to minimize the exposure of the meat to like the dirt and the elements, um, because who wants to eat dirt and pine needles? I don't, I want to eat the meat. Um, so then also something that they could do, and this is kind of specific for mountain lions, is they'll use a site as a latrine or a bathroom. Um, so this is unique to mountain lions, um, but they pile 
this duff area is what it's called. Um, and usually it contains like one to five scats or poop. Um, so this minimizes basically the smell around the meat. So if a predator comes over or something comes over and wants to take it, they smell the scat instead of the fresh meat. Um, so then they kind of leave it alone. So sometimes they mountain lions will come and use the latrine um, multiple times, or sometimes they will only use it once. It just depends on how long that kill is there. And when we're talking about an eat right away, um, if a female and a bunch of cubs, they can almost eat an entire carcass. Um, there's been sometimes like a, a large male can eat about 10 pounds of food right away and then they cash it. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, they kill about one deer a week. So um, they can eat quite a bit at one sitting. All right, so the last bit of information that I have, um, and then we can do questions and answers, is just about mountain lions in Nebraska. So um, all this information is on our website as well. So if you have more questions, um, there's stuff on there, and we can certainly send those links to you in the um, evaluation and the email as well. So what's the history of them in Nebraska? So mountain lions are native. They were native alongside with lots of other animals. Um, they were extirpated or eliminated in about the 1890s or so. Um, Back then, um, in 1991, um, there was our first like modern confirmation of a mountain lion. Um, and then in 1995, they were protected as game animals in our statute, um, but statuses have allowed for hunting and they were created in 2012. Um, there are present breeding populations where either there has been multiple or at least one instance of reproduction in four different areas in Nebraska. So the Pine Ridge, which is way like Northwest Nebraska, the Niobrara River Valley, which is kind of north central Nebraska, Wildcat Hills, um, again, out in uh, western Nebraska, and then newly kind of is the northeastern Missouri River Bluff. So these are areas where there has been at least one instance of a female having kittens in that area. So how did they return um, if they were here and then they were gone? How did they come back? So they returned through the expansion of the other large populations in our neighboring states. So South Dakota, Wyoming, Colorado, um, the western part of the United States is kind of getting full and they use about 150 miles of territory. So they need more space. Um, so they're kind of keep moving east. Um, mountain lions in Nebraska are basically part of the larger western population and are not this isolated population that a lot of people believe that they are. Um, but they continue to move back and forth between states. Um, as we know, wildlife do not understand the county or the state lines. They move freely as they wish. Um, so we see lots of populations moving here and there and lots of different places and states. All right, so how many are in Nebraska? Um, there have been genetic surveys conducted between 2010 and 2019 that indicate the population of the Pine Ridge contains um, 22 to 59, with the most recent survey in 2019 that estimated about 34 animals. So they do this through scat dog surveys, um, which I'll mention here in a second, but basically looking at their poop, they find poop that they believe is from a mountain lion. They take DNA samples of it, they send it to a lab, and they say, okay, this mountain lion and this mountain lion are two individual ones or this um, scat that you found and this scat you found are the same animal. Um, so they can make a very good scientific estimation about how many we have. You also have to understand that we're not gonna find every piece of scat and every piece of scat that we do find doesn't necessarily, it's not gonna be fresh enough to do a DNA sample on it. It might be very old and dry. Um, but basically those recent establishment of those areas, there are no estimates for these new populations currently. They've only been done in the Pine Ridge. Um, and then a few more animals typically, like I mentioned, wander elsewhere in the state. There have been some recorded um, mountain lions in places like Omaha and lots of other areas. These are young male mountain lions often, not always, but a lot of times they're looking for a territory um, and they're searching very long distances. So oftentimes they will use the river as kind of a um, interstate, mountain lion interstate, basically traveling um, from different places of the state, and that allows for really good healthy genetic interchange. Um, and it can also replenish those populations through immigration. So new animals coming in and changing that genetic diversity. And then most animals that have been documented in the eastern part of the state, like I mentioned, have been young males, not every single one, but most of them are, and they will typically travel a lot further distances than females, because they're looking for a mate. 
All right, so I mentioned those scat dog surveys earlier. So the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission is conducting genetic surveys that estimate the size of those resident populations. So um, they're also conducting these multi-year projects where they place a GPS collar on the mountain lions throughout the state. Um, if you would like to stick around here after this program, I have a collar that I can show you what it looks like that was on a mountain lion. Um, so they learn more about the population size. They can understand the impacts of that big game prey on those species, the habitat use, and also the movements of them throughout the state. Um, so like I mentioned, there's a really good article in Nebraska land, um, and I can link to it in this um, email as well, um, where there's really good information about kind of in depth about what we're doing with our mountain lions and the genetic um, surveys and the scat dog surveys. So there's some really good information that I can link for you as well. But this is what mountain lion scat looks like. Um, they'll take um, dogs that have been specifically like through a boot camp um, and they've been trained to sniff out mountain lion poop. Um, then they take samples of it, like I mentioned, and then they do genetic testing on it to see how many individual animals we have. All right, here's another, um, like I mentioned, uh, in a typical survey of the Pine Ridge, um, biologists search about two to 300 miles of suitable habitat. And in that time, they collect a few hundred scat samples. So um, Sam Wilson has been part of that. So again, if you have questions, he did a really good article um, in Nebraska land that I can link to as well. All right, so last part is just their role of a predator. So mountain lions are a predator. They're top tier predators. Sometimes people call them apex predators, um, but they do have an effect on the entire ecosystem. So the effect on the biodiversity is often very misunderstood. Um, these animals have been persecuted throughout the, their life. There's very a lot of um, issues regarding them and human conflict. So, um, but they their most important role is a predator and their role of the ecosystem and that biodiversity. So. Um, um, a lot of people, they know that we they killed many deer and also lots of other animals. Um, oftentimes, they will take on prey that are targeted because they are weak or that they are sick. Um, this benefits the herd because it improves their genetics. They're taking out all those um, young sick animals or animals that are weaker um, that really helps with disease transmission um, and that improved genetics. And then also the recent research has shown that mountain lions can be beneficial to lots of different species. Um, I wouldn't call them a keystone species, um, but if you've heard about the wolves, for instance, like in Yellowstone, how when they were reintroduced, um, the willow and the aspen trees regrew, the elk population was smaller. So it's kind of simple to that. They have a very big trophic cascade of all the different animals and plants, even that they help. So there's another also really good article about role of predators in Nebraska that I can link to as well, that talks a lot about um, how good predators are for an ecosystem. So, all right, I think that was it. That was a whole lot of information. I know I talked fast. I had a lot of um, slides today that I wanted to get through. Um, so and I can also show you that GPS collar here, but our next science of will be July 13th. So next week, we're going to be talking about animal communication. And then our very last one will be the science of clouds. We're going to go off on a um, kind of go out on a on cloud nine, if you wish. So all right, so if you really like this, like I mentioned, we'll have lots of links that we will um, link in that email, but we have a Game and Parks Education YouTube channel. We have all of our science of on there. We also have some nature nerd nights. We have nature journaling on there. So a lot of just educational resources that you can watch. And then if you like um, social media, we have a Facebook page, we have an Instagram page, and then also a Nebraska Wildlife Education website where we have PowerPoints, free downloadable scavenger hunts, um, just lots of good information that you can use in classrooms or summer camps or just with your kiddos or grandkids as as well. And then thanks everyone. We'll see you next week. Um, we'll go ahead and check the chat and then I'll show you that caller as well. well there, there was one question, Monica, about uh, their status. So are we worried about their species in the future? Are they doing well enough? Yeah. So their population all that status? Yeah, and I see that you linked to the um, wildlife management plan. All mm -hmm. that information would be in there. Um, so uh, if they would like to look through that, that would give them some really good answers as well. And I can also link to that um, when we talk about um, uh, when I send that email as mm -hmm. well. So and I know there's a ton of information today, um, but I will send tons of links. Um, I can link some of those papers as well so that people can read through them if they really, really like to. Um, and then um, we can kind of go from there. So sounds good.
Um, someone did answer or ask the question, how would a male know if kittens are his or not? Um, the smell is one of the things has how I understand it. Um, animals also uh, kind of understand like which females they've, um, everyone has a smell in that pheromone. And if they do not smell like him, they're gone. So um, that's kind of a lot of carnivores and a lot of cats is how I understand it. Um, that was a really good question. Someone asked, what is the force of their bite? I am not sure. I'm sure I could look it up or I could ask Sam. That's a good question. And I don't want to tell you. So it but, could be uh, around 400 pounds per square inch. Okay. Because like crocodiles, I don't know why I just know this. Crocodiles. Yeah. What's that a comparison to? <laughs> there are a lot more like a snapping right. turtle. I want to say is, um, like a common snapping turtle, I think either has like 200 or 400. And so um hmm. yes and so it's quite interesting to compare those two all right good i'm glad people learned something thank you so much for coming today i hope you learned a little bit more about um mountain lions a lot of people have asked for this as we've done evaluations one of the questions i always ask people is there something that you would like to see um and one of those has been mountain lions for a couple of years so i'm glad we finally got to do it and i hope that you um, all learned quite a bit from that as well so thank you everyone for joining us and i will get that email sent to you probably monday so thank you and thanks amber for um being a co-host i appreciate it all right. Well, we'll see everyone. Have a great rest of your week and good weekend. And we will see you next week on the 13th. All right. Thanks, everyone.